Okay, good morning. So we're, uh, so let's try that again. We're going to introduce a new technique of integration today um, called the partial fraction decomposition. And the partial fraction decomposition is a lot like well, I guess it's not exactly like anything we've um, done before, but I'd say it's most similar to trigonometric substitution. Not in terms of stuff like how complicated it is, but in that it's a very sort of see it and use it technique. There is one case where we can use partial fraction decomposition, it's rational function. So if we see a rational function, we think it's probably a partial fraction decomposition. <laughs> Again, with the caveat that just like Just like with um, into, um, trigonometric substitution, you could have a problem that looks like trigonometric substitution, but is actually something else. You can likewise have a rational function that looks like partial fractions, but is actually something else. So there's never, I mean, you do always have to be careful. Still. That's so heck, what's the point of? carefully erasing everything. We'll just go to a new frame. So I said this out loud. Let me write it on the board. Partial fraction decomposition is, as I say, a tool for integrating rational functions and partial fraction decomposition is based on the idea that some rational functions can be integrated just using the tools we have available to us. So we do not need partial fraction decomposition to integrate one over x minus one dx. How would we integrate that. You can just use U substitution. U substitution. Thank you. Quite a small U substitution. It's always nice when DU just equals DX. One over U DU is the natural log of the absolute value of u plus c. It's the natural log of the absolute value of x minus one plus c. And you know, as long as that thing we have in the denominator is simple enough, and by simple enough, I basically mean a linear, we can do this. I mean, if we complicated this slightly, if we let me uh, if 
we complicated this slightly, like if we put a three here, we have a three there, du would no longer be dx, so we'd have to put this three we need in, and we'd need to put the one third in as well. But it's still amenable to you substitution. <laughs> and a partial fraction decomposition is the following idea. Rational functions can be written as the sums of simpler rational functions. So factoring is much less famous cousin. You can write polynomials as the products of simpler polynomials. You can write rational functions as the sum of simpler rational functions. And that probably makes the idea what's on this frame combined with this observation that some rational functions we can just integrate using U substitution. I mean, those two ideas together give us the, the method. Say that we want to integrate a rational function, but we can't because it's complex. Complicated. Rewrite the rational function as the sums, or the sum, I should say, of a bunch of simpler rational functions. Hopefully, those simpler rational functions will be simple enough to integrate, although, sadly, that is not always the case. And then, because integration is linear, that fancy word that means that the integral of a sum can be broken up as the sum of integrals. We can now try to deal with each of those simpler rational functions separately. Now, um, as always, you sort of have to strike a balance in calculus too. I think um, textbooks go sometimes kind of far in the present all of the information, even if it's not going to be super useful school of things. Um, the more complicated the rational function is, the harder it is to write it as the sum of simpler rational functions. And the less likely it is that those simpler rational functions are going to be um, integrable, if, if that's a word. But um, this at least provides us with a good way of dealing with some um, cases that show up a lot in applications, like in differential equations, for example. Let's look specifically at the case where our polynomial 
up on top is just some constant. And we've got a quadratic down here. Doesn't even have to be, let's, let's let it be more complicated than a constant. It could be linear. And we have a quadratic down there. And this quadratic factors. And that might sound <laughs> that might sound like a super stiff requirement because frankly, factoring is one of those things that we present in, you know, algebra and kind of obsess about. And then we can't use it, it seems like, in most real world problems. Like if you're looking at the height of a thrown object. And you get, you might have a polynomial that looks like this, and there's no chance that you're going to factor that polynomial. <laughs> Um, once again, technology comes to our assistance. Factoring a polynomial means finding its roots. And if a quadratic has two roots, we're going to assume, and this is actually important, we're going to assume something slightly stronger than being factorable. We're going to assume that it can be factored and its roots are different. Then we should be able to um, hit this with partial fraction decomposition, and we should wind up with integrals that are simple enough for us to take, at least hopefully. And I, I, I think I sort of um, broke off a thought earlier. What I was saying was that because polynomials factor in terms of their roots, and at this point, we have so many easy ways of finding roots technologically. Like we could go, just go to Desmos and graph the quadratic and get the roots. Um, we don't need to be able necessarily to factor in our head. We just need to be able to factor. <clears throat> So where were we? Negative 4.9x squared plus 1.17x. Plus. <laughs> 3.4. Okay, this thing has a root at 0.961. And it has a root at negative 0.722. Subtracting a negative is the same as addition.
And there, if we did have that thing in the denominator of a fraction, we would be able to factor it, and we'd be able to hit it with this method. So, in this specific case, here's how partial fraction decomposition works. We can have whatever up here, it shouldn't matter, ax plus b, or rather I'm having a lie, um, we can have a linear function up there is what I meant. Let me write down a requirement of this technique that the degree of the top needs to be less than the degree of the bottom. I mean, you can think of this if the degree tells you how big a polynomial is. This is sort of the equivalent of saying that we, our fraction isn't improper, that we have the smaller thing up top and the bigger thing down below. Um, lots of... Lots of letters here. So when we do partial fraction decomposition, having a number up front is kind of inconvenient. Fortunately, we know that we can pull constants out of integrals. So we can just pull that C out. and assume that we get this. Actually, this is all correct, but I'm not even for the moment going to think of this in terms of integration. We have a rational function. We want to write it as the sum of simpler rational functions. I mean, we know that our ultimate goal is to um, deal with integration. Let's assume that if we have any number like that C in the denominator, we have pulled it out like that. And now let's just work with this. Okay. So this can be written as some number, capital A sub one, let's say, divided by the first term in the factoring, plus some other number, capital A sub two, let's call it, times the second term in the factoring. And as I say, if you have this quadratic and you can factor it, you can do this partial fraction decomposition. And from a calculus point of view, you are golden. That x minus r1 and x minus r2, both of those we can integrate just using u substitution. So how do we do that? I mean, that's the, that's the real big thing here. And I'm going to answer that question by looking at an example. Uh, 
let's take this and let's try to do partial fraction decomposition on it. Let's try to write it as what we call these letters doesn't matter and varies based on my mood. But I think I used a sub one and a sub two in the last frame, so we'll keep them. Okay, so we, I'm, I'm claiming we can always do this. And our goal then is to figure out what a sub one and a sub two are. And we're going to solve for a sub one and a sub two. We're going to find them. We'll start by multiplying both sides by the denominator of this fraction. And when you do that, a lot of cancellation is going to occur. I mean, on the left, pretty much everything cancels. You multiply by here, since it's our very first example, let's write it all in. We're multiplying by the denominator. Let's see. So on the right, we multiply by the denominator and x minus one and multiplication distributes over addition. So we wind up with that. And then what I was saying about basically everything um, cats thing, or a lot of this cats thing, on the left, the uh, x minus ones cancel and the x plus twos cancel. And the only thing we are left with is that 2x term. Over here, this x minus one and this x minus one cancel. This x plus two and this x plus two cancel. And we get two x equals a sub one times x plus two. Plus a sub two times x minus one. And now, um, there's an easy way to solve this, and there's a time-consuming way to solve this. And in keeping with my philosophy, I'm going to present the easy way. Um, when you look at more complicated um, rational functions, this easy way isn't always going to work, but I would suggest that if you're looking at complicated functions, you should consider whether you want to be doing it by hand anyway. And what I'm calling the easy way has a fancy name, which I'll write down. The so-called heavy side method. 
heavy side, incidentally. That's not a misspelling. That's a name. Um, it's a name you've seen before, way back in Calculus 2, when I was looking at piecewise defined functions. We once looked at an, a function that looks like this. And that function is called the heavy side function. So one of these people who distinctly not a household name, but he has made his presence known in the history of mathematics. So the heavy side method says, well, this is true. And in fact, this is true for every X. It's true for X equals zero or one or negative 17. The heavy side method is picking values of X that turn factors to zero. One of those statements that probably looks like gibberish until you first do it, after which it will hopefully look pretty straightforward. When I'm talking about factors, I mean that x plus two and that x minus one. The terms that came from the left, the terms that were initially in the denominator on the left. Um, so x plus two will be zero if x is negative two. That's what I mean when I say we should pick terms that turn factors to zero. X minus one will be zero when X equals positive one. And what happens when negative two and positive one get dumped into this equation, well, negative two gives us negative four equals zero plus a two times negative two minus one. That is to say negative four equals negative three, a sub two, and a sub two is four thirds. If we let x be one, we get two equals a sub one, times one plus two plus zero. Two equals three, a sub one. Two thirds equals a sub one. And that's certainly nicer than the alternative. I mean, with this quadratic, doing the alternative wouldn't be the end of the world. I'll just put it up kind of as a matter of record. The alternative to the heavy side method, and we might use this in an example, um, at some point, the, 
The alternative to the heavy side method is to simplify everything out on the right. 2x equals a sub 1 times x, and we've got an a sub 2 times x. And then we've got a 2a sub 1 and a negative a sub 2. And then on the right, we have 2x, which we can say is 2x plus zero. And now we have a polynomial equals a polynomial. And for two, um, I should say, we, we, this is the fancy notation. Two polynomials are identically equal. We're not trying to solve for x. We're not saying these curves intersect somewhere. We're saying these are the same lines. The line on the left and the line on the right are identical. Well, for that to happen, the slopes of the lines have to be the same. And the y-intercepts of the lines have to be the same. And now you've got a system of linear equations. And you, we haven't taken linear algebra and talked about solving systems of linear equations, but we can do our best. This says that a sub two is two times a sub one. So taking that and plugging it in here, two equals a sub one plus two a sub one. Uh-huh. Oh, that's fun. Oh, no, I was going to, uh, I, I forgot that we got a sub two before a sub one here. So I was thinking something had gone wrong, but nothing's gone wrong. A sub one is two thirds. And then once we know that a sub one is two thirds, well, two is a sub one plus a sub two. Subtract two thirds from the left. And we do of course wind up with the same a sub one and a sub two. But I mean, this method ha does have some advantages. You can use it in complicated situations where the heavy side method fails. Again, it's just kind of my philosophy, my opinion that you shouldn't be doing really complicated problems by hand anyway, if you can help it. And also, you know, Wolfram Alpha or any computer or Python, you know, the right Python program. I mean, basically anything will just do the partial fraction decomposition for you. So it's always, how much time do we really want to spend looking at complicated cases? Uh, I'm rambling a little, sorry about that. So we did um, the heavy side method and we found a sub one and a sub two. Um, 
a sub one was two thirds, a sub two is four thirds. And it would be somewhat more normal to write this with that denominator in front. It's considered kind of bad uh, notation to have fractions with fractions in the um, numerator or the denominator for that matter. All right, well, that gives you a moment to finish writing down. Now let's see, I mean, I, I introduced this as a, um, as an integration technique. Let's integrate. 2x over x minus one times x plus two dx. Well, that rational function we've seen can be written as the sum of simpler rational functions. It's two thirds times one over x minus one. And four thirds times one over x plus two. Yes. Yeah. The integral of a sum is the sum of the integral. So we can look at that first expression. And we can look at that second expression. Those constants can, I mean, they could just stay in there and not really do any harm, but it might be best to pull them out. Like so. And now we have two little u substitutions. u equals x minus one, du is dx. So this turns into the integral of one over u du, which is the, ab the natural log of the absolute value. I'm writing the plus c just out of habit. We'll have a single c at the end here. And then over here, we could just use u again, or we could say, well, I don't want to use u twice to mean two different things and use w or something. It will be precisely the same answer in any event. And 
And putting those together, there's our answer. We uh, not leave myself a lot of space. I feel like having recognized that with the whiteboard, I can just create new frames. My, uh, my board economy has kind of gone to pit. So that's... Uh, Two-thirds times the natural log of the absolute value of x minus 1. Plus four-thirds the natural log of the absolute value of x plus 2. Plus C. And there's our partial fraction decomposition. And we stated this in terms of a definite, of an indefinite integral. Um, but nothing fancy happens if we're taking a definite integral. Um, this is a good time to observe and We'll actually be talking about this pretty soon. Um, this rational function isn't defined everywhere. It's not defined at one, and it's not defined at negative two. And again, just looking ahead a bit, I'd like to drive home that the fundamental theorem of calculus assumes that your function is defined everywhere where you're taking the integral. So I said, oh, if you're taking a definite integral, nothing special happens. But if you try to take this definite integral, you would wind up running into problems because this definite integral is not defined on the entirety of the interval. It's not defined. Um, this rational function is not defined at one. On the other hand, if you wanted to integrate from two to three, now everything's defined and nothing goes wrong. And I don't want to load my calculator up for this, but you know the process. You'd stick in the three, you'd stick in the two, and you would subtract. By the way, I don't remember if it was anyone here or if it was online students, a few students, um, you know, basically doing stuff right, but getting a little sloppy and leaving absolute values out of the natural log when you're taking those definite integrals. But so we're going from negative seven to negative five. Now, um, we absolutely need those absolute values. If we didn't have them, then when we stuck that negative five in, we get the natural log of a negative number and our calculator will spit an error message back at us. So those absolute values aren't there just to 
to take up space or be bothersome. They're necessary for when you're using the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, so this is what I, um, sort of the simplest case. It's also what I think is the most important case. You know, in terms of concrete applications, I can give them to you for this. I mean, maybe not in this class, but in differential equations, where we look at a very famous population model, the logistic model, we wind up with an integral that we have to solve using partial fractions, and it winds up in this simple, simple in scare quotes, but this most elementary case. Um, we should at least look at other cases, so we'll do that Wednesday. I'm not totally sure what we'll do Thursday. I don't think I opened any other section, but we'll see. In any case, I will also get your tests back to you.